Um, okay, well, I think we're in, I think you're probably in the right place, and I'm probably in the right place. Um, we might have met before, certainly met one or two of you uh, in 303, uh, if you've taken that. Usually it's uh, in the sequence of, uh, let me ask, who is not an environmental systems engineer here? Oh, well. So the people who are not, uh, what uh, disciplines you from? Environmental resource management. ERM. Okay. Geoscientist. Geoscientist. Bioengineer. Bioengineer. Cool. GSI. Yeah, okay, that's nice. So we often get that uh, diversity, but the uh, the vast majority of students are those who are uh, environmental systems engineering majors. People let themselves in since we're on a corridor. Um, this uh, is an elective class in that major, and obviously it's elective in the other programs. It may be part of the GSI hydrogeology um, program. I think it is. Um, if you are in the right place uh, for uh, Environmental Systems 408, uh, the syllabus is what I just handed around. Um, this uh, class is basically a follow-on class for um, 408, uh, GSI 408, which also I think um, the Environmental Systems Engineering students uh, take as part of their uh, program. So I always vacillate how to run this course. I'm never quite sure. It's evolved over time. Um, last year we flipped the class. God, that was a disaster, I thought. Um, I actually read the SRTs last night, and the students thought it was a disaster as well, which I thought was kind of curious, because flipping the classroom, I guess, is supposed to be uh, all the rage. And so, But for, for us, I don't think it, it worked. The, the idea was that since, uh, for those of you who have taken fluid mechanics uh, with me, uh, you know that we record the lectures and put them online. So we did that for this class, not last year, but the year before. And so we had those all, all those remnant videos on my YouTube channel. And so the task was for the students to go and look at them uh, in the piece of their own uh, habitat, I guess, their own house, and then come to class prepared. And then we'd talk about what they didn't understand, uh, and then we'd go through the homework assignments. But it turned out that I'm, I'm guessing that most people did not uh, look at that. I'd imagine it, I'd be surprised if 10% of the, the students did that. And so I, I just thought it was a waste of time. And I, thought it, I think they thought it was a waste of time as well uh, by looking at the SRT comments, which I finally read uh, last, last night, one, a year after, after the course, six, nine, 10 months after. Um, so we won't do that. So I think uh, we'll go back to the more traditional uh, format of this. So traditional format is that uh, we'll talk about the material that's in the course bindering class. Um, I will record it. I will post it. Um, because we flipped the classroom, we kind of made attendance mandatory or certainly highly encouraged. I'm not uh, interested to repeat that uh, this time. So you have to decide uh, whether you'll come or not. I think to make sure that people who decide not to participate in the class, uh, which I would encourage people to do, to, to, to participate in the class, to not, not to not participate in the class, um, we'll have quizzes, uh, which will be worth a portion of the score. And so what I've handed out for you is uh, a syllabus. Uh, so you'll see from the syllabus um, that you have here what we have going on. Uh, you found out where we are. You found out what the time is. Um, there are some resources available to you. Um, I think the past uh, materials, are, perhaps we won't open on this hot link uh, in um, Skim, the particular PDF reader I have. Uh, but what we will do is we'll record the classes and we'll put them online on, on YouTube. So they're there to look at if you, if you so wish. I did last night make a... Uh, course resource page, which I thought worked really well for um, fluids. Uh, and you can find it. It's on the syllabus. But all the material you need is basically referred to in this page. Um, the syllabus is, is online. Um, all the course notes that we have, you should be able to download. It's a big file. I uh, didn't download for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, I am obviously online. Uh, it worked not so long ago. Um, the YouTube channel should be accessible. It's not going to work for me. Oh, yeah, it works. So um, all the 
material, I guess, from 2013 is, is online because we didn't record last year. So that's uh, available to you should, should you so wish. Um, and all the other material is there. So what I will do is after each class, uh, the previous Quite class in the previous year, which is one of the books on the is back. On. Uh, but I will post up the new stuff each time, so it's there. So you can choose yourself. I, I prefer it that way as well, that you should choose exactly how you want to prosecute this for yourself, your young adults, and able to make those decisions, uh, obviously. And so um, it's great to have you here. If this is the last time we see you, then that's okay as well. But uh, uh, we'll just go through the uh, the syllabus, so at least you know what the uh, the deliverables are. So, so there's that website that covers most of the materials. In terms of uh, what's going on, so uh, if I didn't introduce myself, my name is Derek Ellsworth, we go on first name terms. I actually read the SRTs for 303 last night and all kinds of people were using first name terminology, so I think that's a, uh, a victory. Uh, I think many of the students are still in kind of high school mentality of Mr. This and Mr. That. But, uh, so I, I presume to call you by your first names, and I'm fine if uh, you, uh, you reciprocate. Um, the textbook for the class, Yifeng is the TA. He's a doctoral Hi, student in, uh, in our group. He's working on uh, geothermal energy, uh, simulating geothermal energy. He's from Wuhan in China originally, he's with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from uh, China University of Geoscience in, in Wuhan, and a yeah. master's degree from... Cal State Long Beach, right, yeah. in geosciences. So he's working in our department now. Um, you'll probably set up office hours as time goes on. Um, uh, from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, Thursday. Okay, that's actually not bad, because it's right after class, and your assignments will be due on Thursdays. And so um, uh, we'll talk about exactly how we'll deal with that in class. I, I propose actually this year, uh, the, the assignments are a big issue for students in this class. Uh, and that's okay, because they're actually meant to be. They're kind of open-ended assignments. I think you're not used to that. You're used to fluid mechanics textbooks questions where there's a, an answer to five decimal places, um, which you should get. And these questions aren't like that. They're open-ended. You have to, There's no single way to do it. Uh, it's not obvious sometimes how to see your way through it. But thinking about it and trying to figure that out, I think, is the essence of... of um, of what I'd like you to try and get out of this class. And so maybe on the Tuesdays, if you remind me, the final 15 minutes, we'll go through uh, a quick route through through the assignments as they become due the, fall, the next two days hence. So that's about the right time, right? Doing it a week ahead or a week and a half ahead, I think, is probably not, not a good use of time because you won't perhaps have thought about them by then. And so, so that's what we might do. And so, so, so uh, Yi has some office hours set uh, available. His office is right next door to mine, if you know where my office is. Um, and that, that timing is pretty good. I'm sure if you need him outside those hours, you can probably set up an appointment as well. Um, in terms of text, there is a text for it. It's actually not a bad text, I think. It's um, Fetter's text. Let's see if this works. This doesn't work. Oh, that's interesting. Why is that? oh, it's not working. It's not plugged in. That's why. That might be a good reason, don't think. Oh, fantastic. So yeah, so this is uh, Fetter's book. I would say it's kind of an upper undergraduate uh, level, maybe graduate level text, lower graduate level text. And it really is a follow-on in the material. For those of you who take 452, what text do you use? Do you use the other Fetter book, like a green Fetter book? Yeah, okay. And so I think it follows on logically from that. I don't think you need it. Uh, it used to be that you needed it because of the software program in there, which we used to use in the modeling, but that's no longer true. And so you need to decide whether you want to or not. Uh, Yi has a copy. It's, uh, yeah. it's in the, the, the bookstore. There's also a, a copy on reserve in the library if you want to get access to it. And I would say that um, most of the material, you can get through this class without it, if you so wish. Um, so, so you make that. Has anyone bought a copy? Does anyone know how much it is? I have no idea myself. So it's, it's up to you to, to decide on that. Um, it is a follow-on class from GSI 452. And so uh, 
that is a prerequisite. Uh, I don't enforce prerequisites. Those people who contacted me about prerequisites, I told them that here are the materials that are online. You should look at them, and if you feel comfortable with them, then that's fine. It's your, your choice as to what you should take. So I never enforce uh, uh, prerequisites. It's up to individuals, I think, to decide whether they can handle it or not, and people can best uh, figure that out themselves. Um, in terms of uh, the uh, deliverables for the class, so I've also changed it from last year. So I, it was interesting to read through the, the commentary. So they didn't like the fact, and I don't blame them, because uh, you had to spend an hour watching the videos to come to class to spend another hour and double your time, although I'm not sure that people, the majority of people actually did spend that hour. Um, and also we have a project with this class. We used to have two projects. One was a design project, and I'm going to shelve that for this year. And it's based on the comment that most of us are seniors. We're about to graduate. We can't get our shit together to be able to do any group work whatsoever. And, uh, <laughs> and we don't want to have to do that. And so, yeah, why not? For one year, let's not do that. We still have a group project, so you don't get off scot-free. Um, and so the, the deliverables right now are, are I guess, 75% are on your own recognizance and a quarter are as a group with some kind of peer review. So the, um, the assignments are uh, open-ended assignments, there's about nine of them, and they are real-world, I think real-world assignments, uh, to, to try and test your ability to synthesize what we talk about in class. So we don't really go through a, a very step-by-step -step process of exactly what the recipe is, but we'll, we can talk about that in the 15-minute the overviews that we give to this. There is a midterm which will be in the week before um, uh, spring break. And so if you look on the back of your sheet, you'll see this little red dot, maybe not a red dot in the back of your sheet, but the Tuesday before spring break. Uh, and the Thursday before spring break, we won't do anything. So uh, so you, at least you can plan. Uh, you need to be around for the test, obviously. Uh, and so maybe put that down in your on your calendar to, to, to put that on, on there. Content quizzes, I think, are not I think, are what we'll set up. Maybe ten questions, five, ten questions, multiple choice, three attempts to quiz you on what we talked about either in class or in the recordings of in class. And so they'll be on Angel. And so uh, we'll do that. So the ones for today will be due, I guess, by midnight on Thursday. The ones for Thursday will be midnight on Tuesday. And so on. I think that allows you to plan. It's good to have some structure, I think, to this. And the remediation presentation uh, will be, uh, if that will come up, yeah, it is. So is based on teamwork, a group. So we'll have six teams. I think we have 25 students here, so it's about four people per team. We will divide you up based on, just like in 303, the rationale is the same. When you go and work for Chevron or ExxonMobil or Ed Miser down the road, um, they don't ask you who you want to work with uh, when they put you in a team. They put you in a team, and that's that's how you're stuck. And so we'll, we'll use the same rationale here. And so the basic idea is to prepare a presentation for basically one period around each of these six uh, remediation methods. Um, another reason to kind of uh, put the remediation project, where you design a remediation method and apply it to a site on a back burner, is that typically the exposure to this comes right at the end of the class. And so you're least prepared to, to, to do the design until the class is over when you've got to get that in. And so the timing isn't so optimal for that. And so I think, well, I'm, I'm curious to see how it works out by removing that. Maybe you decide that we've gutted the class without it and you don't want to do it, and that, that's OK as well. But uh, it'd be interesting to get some, some feedback on this. But I think doing the, the presentation would be fine, and we'll have some examples for that. And it's reasonably well structured in terms of what we want. We talked about how it works, uh, whether it works well in all types of soils, why it doesn't work in some, uh, how it's actually implemented in the field, what equipment do you need, and what does it look like when you do that, uh, what the level of demonstration and proof of concept is, whether it's established or it's experimental, uh, what the applicability limitations are, and how much does it cost per ton or per cubic yard, etc., to be able to. And so there are some examples of that in the notes that we have from what, when I used to have that and teach it myself. They're a little dated, but they should 
actually provide a, a reasonable background, I think, to be able to, to do a good job on that. I thought that worked out well for the teams that took it seriously last time. Uh, there's always uh, a spectrum of uh, engagement, I guess, right, as, as you know. Uh, and also, there's, uh, in addition to kind of evaluating each of these portions of the presentation, uh, there's a peer review, which is a multiplier. So you multiply your grade by some amount based on what your colleagues thought you contributed to it, metered in some way. It doesn't usually turn out to be a problem, but that's usually just a stopgap for those who are you know, physically you know, absent, AWOL, uh, during the whole process. It doesn't, doesn't often happen. So that's the, the fourth component, so 25%. So that's our, our plans, I think. Uh, um, I think it, compared to 303, for instance, I keep on mentioning that. I know some of you haven't had that. Uh, you don't need it in this class. Uh, but you're able to at least chart where you are and what your grade will be somewhat better, I think, because most of the stuff is, is up front. Uh, most of the, the assignments, for instance, of which there are nine, will be pretty much done, or a big stab at them done by the time you get to, uh, to spring break, right, which is eight, eight weeks in. So I don't know. Any questions? I'm doing all the talking. I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any. No? Don't be like that. Right. Um, in terms of uh, materials, uh, so it's a follow-on from physical hydrology. So physical hydrology is 452, flow in porous media, uh, storage, hydraulic conductivities, permeabilities, rates of flow, groundwater yield. Uh, I'm not sure absolutely exactly what is taught about in that. Did, did anyone take it this past fall? Was Dave Yoxheimer teaching it? It was, yeah. He said the other day he was. And so uh, I also asked him if he wanted to come and guest lecture here, and he said yes, so maybe you'll see him again, but I'm not sure. Um, but this follows on from that. So rather than talking about flow of the tracking the fluid, the, trans, the, the movement of the fluid, the volumetric flow of the fluid, we're typically interested in how contaminants move. And contaminants move in a couple of ways. They move as free phases. So you drop gasoline into the soil. It travels as gasoline, and it also travels as gasoline dissolved in water, if it, once it gets to the water table. And so we have to look at each of those uh, two components. So how the free phase gets into the groundwater, maybe it takes a month, two months to get to where it rests. If it's gasoline, it's on top of the groundwater table. If it's something that's dense to the water, it'll sink to below the groundwater table. So figuring out how it tra travels in through the Vado zone, how it travels to hit the groundwater table, and if it's denser than water, how it travels below the groundwater table, and to understand where that source might ultimately rest as a, as a component. And then once we understand something about that, through understanding uh, the behavior of multi-phase flow, which is uh, the top uh, topic, really, the first topic uh, in terms of physical hydrology, we're really talking about multi-phase flow, how it gets to where it is, how non-aqueous phase liquids that are lighter than water and those that are denser than water travel in the subsurface, where they get to, and then ultimately uh, what happens to them once they dissolve in groundwater. So once they dissolve in groundwater, they can be carried with the physical tracking of the uh, water as a, a dissolved component. Can people, I should have asked this at the beginning, can people see this at the bottom? Just? I can barely see it sitting here. Um, and so we talk about contaminant hydrology. Contaminant hydrology says something about the rates at which components will be carried downstream by the bulk motion of the water if we know what the bulk motion of the water is from understanding the concepts of uh, 452. And they'll travel downstream unretarded, um, so to speak, to use the, the colloquial term. And that means that if they don't react with the substrate that they're flowing through, the, the sand that they flow through or the clay that they flow through, they'll arrive downstream at the same strength as they are upstream. If they're sorbed onto the, uh, the grains that they pass through, then they'll be re reduced in concentration. And that may be a good thing because it reduces its effect downstream. Maybe a bad thing because if you clean up the downstream, then because it's been sorbed onto the grains, if you clean up the upstream, then water still flowing through that will actually desorb the stuff that's been sorbed onto the grains and actually re-entrain it back in the groundwater flow. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. So multi-phase flow is the first topic. How dissolved components dissolve and are ultimately carried in the saturated water phase. 
how they may react with the material that they travel through uh, to be able to reduce the loading is an important uh, component. Um, and for those components that are trapped as a free phase or dissolved in water um, within the Vado zone, what are their fate? How does soil vapor extraction work in terms of volatilizing those and removing them? And so it's really a porous media flow and transport class where we try and understand the mechanisms by which it, uh, these components travel in the subsurface. So we will try and understand what happens in terms of the physics of their behavior at some level. And so if you haven't had 452, look at the notes that we have, which are this bumper... Um, this, uh, this is in here. I, I guess I tried to download them, but they didn't. It's, it is... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure it's not working on my machine. So it might be limited by the bandwidth or something. But there's a, a large book of notes which is available online and is available on my desktop somewhere. I guess this might be here. Yeah, it's this. So this is the title page, and it's really just a bunch of uh, what were acetate overheads, which have been uh, scanned, and, and we'll use them throughout the class to be able to to uh, to be able to to illustrate, if you like, some of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, so to be able to upscale things, and if you step into any design office these days, uh, typically what you they'd want you to do is be able to model the behavior of what is the fate of this plume as these components get tr transited downstream. So we'll deal with that in two ways. We'll talk about very simple mathematical models, such as fine difference models, as background of how they work. And then we'll talk about implementing them in, a, in running a code. And so we'll do both of those. And there'll be a, an assignment related to that. We'll spend a little bit of time, uh, since in all of the models that we'll have dealt with, we rely on the fact that we have an aquifer that's carrying these components downstream. But the reality is, if you go on a site visit, you physically stand in the field and stuff is underneath your feet, and you have absolutely no idea what the characteristics are of the subsurface, which will allow this stuff to be carried downstream. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about how you get the parameters that in the previous, by then, six or seven weeks, we'll have talked about needing to use to be able to characterize behaviors. How do you get those parameters to be able to understand how the subsurface will behave? What will it look like in terms of whether it's layered or whether it's faulted and fractured? Uh, and what are the techniques that you might use to that when you get a job as an entry-level engineer or a geoscientist at a, a consulting company and they'd send you out on your first day to physically go and drill a well with a driller or to sample some uh, well waters uh, with, with, with someone as well. And so we'll talk about uh, characterization of aquifers and aquacludes. Aquifers are the components which are important to us because they transit these materials. Aquacludes and aquitards are important also because they act as barriers to keep them pristine. Uh, so we want to be able to understand what the characteristics are that define each of those and how we might characterize them. And then the final part, as I said, uh, is for you to discover on your own, to be able to talk about uh, to remediation. And so we divide that up into six areas, thermal remediation, liquid methods, soil vapor extraction, electrokinetic methods, uh, uh, bioremediation, and one other sitting in there, which I can't uh, recall off hand. Oh, it, yeah, soil, soil washing and, uh, and digging up stuff, I guess, are the six. And so we'll leave you to, to do that. Um, there are some references for this. Uh, some of the work that we use is taken from Jacob Baer's book, for, especially in the first part that we talk about on uh, multi-phase flow. That's available in the library. We only use really chapter nine, but if you want to get background on that, that's quite useful. Um, it's a classic text, so it's dateless, I guess. So it doesn't really matter that it's 1988. Um, Cohn and Mercer and Grubb and Sitar um, are both should be on loan on the library. This is an EPA report which talks about site investigation and actually many of the things that we'll talk about in this class for dense non-aqueous phase liquids, organic chemicals that are the product of you know, the Love Canal initiators uh, that were found in groundwater in the 1970s, were killing people in the 1970s, um, and were a big problem in terms of 
characterizing, locating where they are, characterizing their behavior, and then remediating them. And so the Cohen and Mercer book is an EPA report, which is quite a nice, concise treatment. Again, a bit uh, dated, but still actually quite quite adequate. Uh, Feder is our book, uh, so that, uh, don't worry about that. And Grubb and Sitar is another text that talks about remediation methods. Again, dated, but actually quite good um, in terms of how it introduces the, the components. Um, academic conduct, uh, don't cheat. Obviously, um, in this class, you're encouraged to work together. I think in many classes you are, but to submit your own work for assignments. Obviously, when you uh, do the remediation work, it's a joint effort, and so you should amalgamate it. I don't think you need to distinguish as to what your individual components are. Sometimes that's quite obvious by who's presenting what uh, in front of the class at what time, so you get some feel for that. Uh, we've, I don't think any group has ever done it. If you want to record your uh, presentation and to upload it onto YouTube in a similar way to the way we've done this here, I think that's fine. I think a number of people did that for their projects in 303 this past year, and I think that's fine. So if you want to do that as a group, uh, I can help you with the, the mechanisms maybe to do that, or you can probably work it out yourself. Um, obviously, it's better to record it. You can record a PowerPoint exactly on the screen just by switching it on and it will record your narrative as you go through it if you so wish uh, without any kind of cameo of yours. I'm not sure where the cameos are useful. Sometimes they're useful for uh, gesticulation as much as anything else. Um, but yeah, so um, submit your own work. Um, when you're doing work together it's fine to submit it jointly obviously. But most of your own work uh, is your own work in the assignments, is in the quizzes and in the exams. So I guess the only one that is not it will be uh, the remediation presentation, obviously. Uh, deliverables, there really is only one group uh, deliverable. I took out the other one, uh, which is the project. I don't don't see anyone going boo-hoo over that right now. So we'll see, I don't, I, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, and this is the at-a-glance uh, deal. The yellows are when I think I might not be around. Um, in that case, then uh, you get, everyone gets to look at the, the stuff that's online rather than just uh, people who don't come to class, uh, regardless to be quizzes attached to it. But these are the, um, the the topical areas. This is how it's divided up in the, the course reader, and so we'll step through it. I put this in here. Uh, I'd like probably in the this is this is the Tuesday. I guess that's not really quite apparent, is it? This is the Thursday. Uh, so this is uh, this is today. This will be three uh, Thursdays from now. So I'm going to get you and your groups to give a, a short update, I think, uh, on where you are with at least putting together your the ideas of your presentation. And I think it's useful to do that early because I think you're quite human as I am, uh, and things get left and. Uh, they get left longer than they, they should do. So it would be a chance for you to have already met with your group, uh, talked about what the components might be, divided and conquered, I think, is how you want to do it. You want to divide it up in such a way to be able to send people off to, to do whatever they need to do. And of course, to be able to do that, then you need to actually know something about the topic as well. So you can't just come into it blind and say, yeah, we'll divide it this way. You can in some respects, because I've given you some divisions. Uh, but I think you need to actually have some, spend some time thinking about it before doing that. And so that's just to uh, to encourage you or to force you uh, in, into doing that. Okay. Um, the rest uh, we mentioned, this is the midterm, which will be here. Um, this is nothing. And I'm sure this will get modified as we go through. Uh, but actually, videos, I think, exist for all of these as they are. So I will replace those or add to them as we do this in class. But uh, so that's that's basically the plan. Okay, uh, what else? What else should I be talking about? Everyone, <laughs> it's fun. Look at the floor. Look at this. Um, all right. So what else do I do? No questions. So anyway, so you can find this by finding me. Uh, I think it's on your syllabus as well. If you find me, 
you'll be able to find this and all the, uh, the materials linked. So I, I thought that worked out well. Um, the assignments are available online. Um, they're open-ended assignment. I guess assignment one is kind of live from today. I guess it will be due a week Thursday. And so um, maybe, as we said, we'll spend 15 minutes talking about it either this Thursday or more likely the following Tuesday with it due the following Thursday. Again, do at midnight. Uh, there are drop boxes on Angel. I think uh, one or two people out of uh, the many people who've gone through this course, it's usually 25 people a year for the last decade and a half. So I guess uh, that's uh, 300 people who've gone through this um, or so, 400 people. Um, about the same as one class of 303. Uh, maybe a, you know, a handful, two handfuls, have uploaded their stuff onto Angel as, as copies. Most people slide it under, I guess, Yee's uh, door, uh, or give it to him, or drop it off in class on the Tuesday. If you're well organized, uh, dropping off in class on the Thursday is probably a, a decent way to do it. Uh, prior tests are also online. I guess this is um, this uh, is basically a little website we made a number of years ago, which I don't really use anymore. But the the, the prior tests without solutions are all available online. Tests are always the same uh, format. Three questions in class, so an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, question number one is 10 definitions, brain dump. Tell me everything you know about permeability, about cap pressure, about conservative transport. Um, the second, two questions, second and third questions are a calculation. If these are the conditions uh, in situ and these are the fluid properties, what will the saturation profile look like in this particular case? So by the time you get to that, you will have the, the tools to, to do that. Um, if you, you can look at the last, well, you see it's been taught for a few years. I think the, the first offering was probably 95. Of course, some people might say that the, the course materials haven't changed that. Well, that may be partly true. But, <laughs> but hey, this is a classic stuff. It's not changing that fast. Um, remediation perhaps has, but uh, you know the, the fundamental underlying principles has not, not changed. And so it used to be that we had a midterm and a final, and that's how we used to do it. Uh, we killed the finals, I guess, in 2006, and we've only done a, a midterm since then. And so you can see the different materials. Uh, you can go through and you can see that some of the stuff will repeat. So you can uh, sensibly and judiciously figure out exactly what uh, you might want to, uh, to work on. We're a long way away from that yet. So. We're seven weeks away, right? We'll be in the eighth week, a week. Uh, seven weeks today will be that. Uh, what else? Yeah. And so there is a, a method in the madness. So the, the deal is Thursdays are the due dates for the assignments. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays after the uh, individual classes are the due dates for the, uh, the quiz stuff. And we will shut them off and and leave them closed after that. Any questions yet? No? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. There, Fantastic. I, well, is there any way to kill like the front lights just to see the screen a little bit better? Yeah. Uh, I don't know how. Oops, what might this be? That's a thermostat. Yeah, there is. Or you, no, you just quickly write the notes down. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Can you still see to write or to text? Yeah, if you've got a text, don't come to class. I, well, I'm not saying this to you, but okay. yeah, I've never quite understood it, so it's okay. So fine, we all have to make these once in a while. But yeah, if you're spending an hour and a quarter texting, that makes to me that makes no sense to come to class when you get it elsewhere. But anyway. The one reason to come to class, I think, you know, maybe students like, well, students are adults. I was saying students like adults, but students are adults, of course. But I think, like, uh, more mature, more senior adults, I guess, uh, is what I'm saying. Is that Everyone, uh, I think structure is good for everybody. And uh, to come to class is part of that structure. So I think it's useful. So, so, but I'm biased in that. Any other questions, since we've broken the ice? No questions? Okay. Well, 
So we have some time on our hands. So this is the, the course reader. So I don't see how many pages it is. I bet you it's 350. Um, uh, we'll use it in a variety of different forms. I just want to say a few things about some kind of local work that I think is that, that this class kind of leads into. And local because it puts into context for people who might be from nominally around here, around here being Pennsylvania, I guess, or central Pennsylvania for this. And so just to, to talk about some kind of broad, broad brush overviews of things. I was involved maybe, I guess it was probably, I bet you it was 20 years ago now, in the mid-1990s. Um, Roaring Spring is a town near Huntington, um, about an hour and a half away from here. Has wonderful bottled water, which you probably see in the stores. Um, has a very large limestone quarry there. And uh, the Roaring Spring is a natural spring, which actually is a very interesting uh, geological structure. The geological structure is basically, actually you see it here, it's a fold. And so the fold is ro are rocks that have been bent over in geological time. And a result of that, you can imagine that if you take a book and you bend it, then you open up things in tension on one side, and you close thing in compression on the bottom side. And as you do that geologically, what happens here is you, you basically mash up the interior of this fold with fractures. So if you look at this fold that's bent over, then along the, the so-called hinge line of this fold, fold is the region of broken rock. And so the Roaring Spring in the town of Roaring Spring is basically a, uh, a zone of fractured rock, which was this kind of region here, which kind of comes out of the page at you. So if I, if I drew this in perspective as something that was getting warped, then it would be this region here, which kind of goes down, whoops, has something here, which all of a sudden captures water, which is flowing, say, uh, east to west. Uh, it, as it flows into here, it flows into this wonderful drain conduit, and it wants to go down this conduit, and as soon as it hits topography at the bottom of a valley, it bubbles out. And so hence the, the name of the town of, of Roaring Spring. And so what it was was a town where the economy is built on a couple of, well, a few different uh, components. Roaring Spring bottled water, who want to keep Roaring Spring water flowing. Uh, Appleton Paper, who's a pulp mill, who want to keep Roaring Spring flowing for a different reason. They have a much larger usage than the bottling company, even though this is probably much more profitable. You realize, of course, that when you buy bottled water, uh, it's probably more expensive than gas, gasoline. Um, which is a little anomalous in some respects. But certainly the big uses of water in the town were Appleton paper. And the third uh, activity in town was New Enterprise Stone and Lime. They're a, a quarrying company. They dig up um, limestone for use in aggregate and for making concrete out of. And they plan to take their existing quarry, which was, say, at, ground, at surface level. This is this perspective of this fold. This is this folded region here. Steeply dipping beds here, which are really quite low permeability, uh, and kind of fractured beds here. So any water that's flowing from the right to the left, west, east to west, I guess, doesn't, yeah, it's east to west in this case, uh, gets trapped by this kind of groundwater dam that sits here. Can't go through this, and instead flows down this hinge line towards the Roaring Spring. And so Appleton Paper were worried that when New Enterprise Line would come in and they'd start benching off this quarry to get to this existing depth where they were, that all of a sudden this stuff is no longer constrained, it's no longer a nice uh, groundwater dam, and instead of the water coming down the, the liniment out into the Roaring Spring, it would start flowing into the quarry. Not good for new enterprise, but also not good for the, the water that's transiting the spring. And so they took them to court, which is how many of these issues are um, solved uh, or dealt with. It was litigated. And uh, the ultimate resolution was that instead of going down in some fail swoop to go down another, I don't know what it was, 300 feet at once, instead you'd go down one bench at a time 
which is 15 meters, uh, 15 feet rather. You'd monitor this to make sure that nothing's going on that's wrong. And it was a kind of a common sense solution to that to be able to understand what's going on. And so how it impacts uh, things very, very locally. And to this day, everything still is just hunky-dory in uh, Roaring Spring, I believe. Uh, around the same time, actually, this is a job. Uh, the cameo in the top is um, in India, subcontinent of India, where I guess John Kerry is now. Is Obama there today as well? I think he was going to be there. That was Kerry's reason for not being uh, with uh, Je suis Charlie, I guess. And none of them were with Je suis Charlie, I guess, over uh, the march on um, on Sunday. But this is a, uh, so again, kind of the, the global picture. So the big debate over climate. The West... Uh, and carbon emissions for the last 100 years through the Industrial Revolution, the developing world, the BRIC nations, Brazil, India, Russia, China, and South Africa, eh, BRICS, I guess. Uh, the developing nations, which now all of a sudden want to have similar economies driven by energy. Cheap energy is often driven by fossil fuels. And so the big debate over uh, climate change is developing world, who's put the stuff in the atmosphere in the first place, does the the developed world has put stuff in the atmosphere. Does the developing world get a free card to be able to match that? That's kind of the, the, the stalemate, I guess, that's involved in all these protocols. But anyway, the lifeblood of a growing India was 20 years ago and still is uh, its reliance on energy. Uh, coal in the eastern portion of the country, I guess, which was uh, Madras, but now is Chennai, right? Uh, on the East Coast, um, going back to Hindi names, I suppose, uh, from the Anglo anglicized names. And so this is a big seam of coal. It's about uh, 30 kilometers from the Bay of Bengal. As you drive there from Chennai, uh, all of a sudden you go from quite a dry climate in Chennai to this beautifully verdant green uh, panorama, which is produced by the fact that to be able to make this coal, they have to pump water out to depressurize the groundwater table make it dry so that they can actually physically extract this in a big open pit, take it out, and as a result of that, they are depleting groundwater and using it reasonably well. Using some of it for agriculture, using some of it uh, in the boilers, it gets evaporated in the conversion of uh, coal to electricity. Uh, but the other result of this is one related to contaminant hydrology, and that is as you pull down the water table here, all of a sudden you create a hydraulic gradient which is a change in head with location. And we know from Darcy's law that if we give a magnitude of permeability and a change in head with location, pressure we might do it, but I guess we can make it a pressure by just dividing by, uh, multiplying by density of water times gravity. This is actually Darcy's law. So as you provide a gradient here, then you make water flow in this direction. If you make water flow in this direction, then all of a sudden when you get out to the coast over here and you have salt water sitting here, you start dragging salt water into what was a freshwater potable aquifer. And that starts creating problems because now instead of pumping fresh potable water out of your, uh, your well bores, uh, you start to uh, produce brine, which of course you can't use for agriculture. You could use in uh, boilers, but you can't use it very easily because it corrodes the pipes and uh, puts deposits in the pipes. So understanding exactly, one, how to be able to excavate the coal by drawing down the water table, what pumping rates you have to apply, what measures you can apply by putting wells in at different locations to be able to minimize the amount of pumping you have to do. And secondly, by minimizing the amount of pump pumping, you also minimize the effects of this uh, groundwater incursion, saltwater incursion, uh, which is also a problem in places in the U.S., like in Florida, for instance, where you have this thin peninsula where they pump groundwater, and the sea, of course, is on each side of the peninsula, and um, with, with problems of making your water brackish. And so pumping water as a, as a resource and its effects on salination, sal 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 salinization of, of existing uh, water as well. This is one of the, the horrible, you know, pre-existing figures that's been around for a long time, only to make one point. 
and that is this is actually a map of the world with the plates on it and so the plate boundaries are this is the mid-atlantic rift coming down here this is the ring of fire going around the pacific all the way here these little lines happen to be measurements of stress uh, at individual points where measurements are made um, and but this is only to make the point that again in an industrialized world uh, one of the big issues uh, that looks to potential contamination of uh, water, water resources and the first assignment you do will be one way related to radioactive waste disposal. And so one of the enduring issues for the West is in figuring out exactly what to do with the 50 years, maybe 60 years now of uh, radioactive waste that's been produced in the you know, commercial uh, nuclear industry to create uh, electricity from nuclear power. What's going to happen to that? By far, the, the preferred solution is to look at deep geological disposal. Uh, a typical idea is to go down maybe 300 meters, 1,000 feet, uh, dig out some tunnels. In those tunnels, put these canisters either within the floor of the individual tunnels in things like are kind of the size of 55-gallon drums, but are much sturdier. Uh, because the waste is only the central part, and the cladding may be, you know, three quarters of the the drum the vitri containing the vitrified waste, or in the former U.S. model, which was Yucca Mountain, to actually drive railroad cars, like the railroad cars you see driving across the country now, the size taking buck and oil from North Dakota to the East Coast because there is no pipeline to do it, and to just put those railroad cars underground in uh, tunnels which are probably five meters in diameter, 15 feet diameter, taller than this room, probably 10 feet to a tall room, and to then leave them there, backfill them, and then leave them there for the rest of their lifetime. And to hope that not too many of them break open, some will break open, and if they do break open, rely on the fact that you have this idea of uh, multiple redundant barriers. The example I always give, that's not a very good example, it's a joke really, but the reason that planes have two wings is because they, you need two in case one breaks off. So of course, they don't fly very well with just one wing. It's the reason why they have more than, they have two jet engines, of course. But um, redundant barriers means that you have multiple layers. So you vitrify the waste, so it's put in a waste form which is glass, so it doesn't leach out of that very well. You put it in a, a container that has maybe copper cladding, so it's resistant to corrosion as well and that's an extra barrier. You put it in the ground uh, in a tunnel and you backfill the tunnel with, in the case of the US, unsaturated zone plan, which was Yucca Mountain before healthcare uh, came along, universal healthcare came along. We'll tell, talk about that story if you wish. Um, and then you backfill it with gravel. The gravel's unsaturated, so that's one other uh, barrier. And then if it does get beyond that, then the rock that goes out from the, the walls of the tunnel to a compliance point where Mary takes her water out of a well, you know, 50 kilometers downstream in Long Street. Uh, the geog geological medium is the final barrier that stops that. And so redundant barriers are one way to do that. So again, it's driven by contaminant transport. Gets into the groundwater system. What rates of flow are the water going to carry it? Uh, what is the effect of retardation and attenuation by sorbing onto the media that passes through? Um, what rates will that occur? Uh, and what you expect the uh, concentrations to be as you go down to some compliance point. And so once you have this thing all put in place, then the basic idea is that you have a glass, low leachable form, you have it in a copper container as cladding, you have it backfilled in the saturated zone uh, repositories, which are every repository in the world except for the US. Then it's typically backfilled with bentonite, a swelling clay with very low permeability, and very high sorption capability. And then that goes within the, the granite that you put it in, which may be you know, a few hundred meters deep. So maybe 300 meters deep, 1,000 feet deep. And then you leave it there for 50 years, the so-called retrievability option in case technology all of a sudden changes so that you can reprocess it and you can dig it back out and reprocess it or reuse it. Or at 50 years or 100 years, you put a, a, a marker on it and you say, don't dig up stuff here, and you walk away for it, and then you hope that it works for a million years. 
And so it's interesting. It's interesting to look at these things in terms of the, the physical size. The physical size would be something covering many hundreds of acres and being only a thousand feet deep. And I think it's also useful to think about in terms of the temporal size, right? So 50 years versus civilization. So a thousand years ago, 1066, people were throwing arrows about it. The, the French were invading the UK, William the Conqueror, uh, 2,000 years, Egyptians in, uh, in the Nile Delta. And so that's only uh, 40 times longer than this 50 years. It's only 40 times longer than we've been producing nuclear waste. So big, big changes in not very, our, our snapshot of, of civilization is really tiny, really very small. And in fact, it's even smaller. So you realize if you're talking to people, young people your age, that um, I can't talk about all the things that I know about that I've lived through because they're irrelevant to you, right? You just, so I, I remember, so if you go to, if any of you looked at the Beloit, we're getting off track here. Uh, the Beloit College, Things You Should Know About Your Freshman. They put out something every year, which is, so for this year, 2015, it would say something like, um, your fresh, typical freshman was born in uh, 1997, right? Is that right? And you should know that the year they were born, this, this, and this, and this. So I can't remember. I don't know what was going on in 1997 to be able to say something about that. But so you're in your freshman year, I guess it would have been uh, 94. Is that right? Is that your birth dates, roughly? Yeah. So, so anyway, so off track. So never mind. Uh, so the way that we'll deal with this class is really to talk about contaminant hydrology in the context of what we've already said is our L napples and D napples. Light non-aqueous phase liquids, lighter than water, so they float on the water table. Denser than water would be organics that sink below it. And they're useful because they allow us to be able to talk about, for, they're useful for two reasons. One, because they allow us to talk about the full range of behaviors from multi-phase flow as to how they get into the subsurface in the first place, and then dissolution, transport, and attenuation in terms of how they then redistribute themselves in dissolved forms. So they allow us to do that. But the other reason is that they're perhaps the more, most pervasive contamination source that's around. And so it makes eminent sense for us to deal with them because typically if you work in this area, if you go and work for uh, Chevron, you'd be working with l apples and gas... Um, gas spills from gas stations uh, and for other underground storage tanks and uh, it's kind of a de facto uh, industrial problem and they behave differently as to whether they float on the water table as a gasoline would and we'll talk about it in more detail in, in the future or if it sinks all the way through the water table as you spill them and goes all the way down to stop for some other reason and the other reason as we'll find out is not because of permeability but because of a capillary barrier. Because the pores are so small that as a free phase it can't physically force itself in there because it's only got this few meters, few tens of meters of head that is trying to push it in there because it's just driven by gravity. It's not got a pressure behind it. And so we'll try and understand the mechanisms by which that occurs. And so we'll deal with that in due course. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, and we'll do some work. Most of your assignments will be about a site called Smithville which is in southwest flat, glacial outwash tills of uh, southwest Ontario, near Hamilton, Canada's Pittsburgh, uh, uh, steel town, uh, probably has more steel in, Pit in Hamilton now than in Pittsburgh, and looking at the mechanisms by which uh, dense non-aqueous phase uh, liquids have spilled from the surface from a lagoon into the groundwater through some limestone aquifers, through some shale aquacludes, and to be able to calculate what the implications are of what's going on downstream. So those will be, uh, um, a bevy of your assignments will be to deal with that. And I won't say any more about uh, that for now. Okay. So that's kind of uh, the things that we'll talk about. Um, the other caveat, I suppose, uh, and we've kind of broached, uh, broached it, is that I don't do very much work on contaminant hydrology in dean apples. And so that you'll, you'll realize that as well. Actually, perhaps you won't realize that, but that's uh, the, the reality. Um, and so the, most of the, the work that I do is related to 
uh, energy fluids. Uh, sometimes it's contaminants, or the, the effects of the contaminants, but sometimes also just as fluids. So in the same way that we'll talk about transport of materials in the subsurface, both as water traveling, but also uh, free phase products moving in the subsurface under gravity, admittedly, uh, and also dissolved components. The, uh, the physics of that process is exactly the same as looking at sucking gas out of Marcellus shale or sucking circulating water through uh, hot rocks in geothermal reservoirs to pull out heat um, or in looking at petroleum reservoirs. And so just to put this in context in terms of the things that perhaps we will say less about, but which is quite topical for Pennsylvania because of what's going on with uh, uh, Marcellus Shale and what it has done for the economy. Now, this, it's pretty clear that you know what happened, certainly in your lifetime, in 2008, with the global financial crisis and uh, what happened to the stock market in the U.S. and then overseas, uh, what happened to unemployment in the U.S. and then overseas, um, was driven by the factors that controlled that. But there's probably not much doubt that coming out of it uh, so quickly, even though the U.S. went in first, you'd expect it to come out first. Uh, certainly Europe is still in the doldrums uh, with regard to that, maybe except with exception, well, may maybe even including Germany, is that one of the reasons the U.S. came out of that was because of uh, gas shale. You can argue that, but certainly the, the unemployment, uh, or the employment has come through uh, the recovery of relatively inexpensive energy. It used to be of the order of eight, dollars per thousand uh, cubic feet of gas and now is of the order of three two and a half dollars per thousand cubic feet of gas because uh, we've been so good at doing that the dividends of uh, having that cheap energy has really sparked a resurgence of a manufacturing uh, industry in the US that had completely left the, the, the US and was all overseas and so companies are coming back from being in the uh, in China and elsewhere, uh, as those as now they're much more competitive because of cheap energy. And so you can argue whether that's good or bad for us as a nation. Um, but the perspective that Richard Smalley gave, so Smalley was the one of the inventors of buckyball, a Nobel laureate, um, now dead, uh, maybe a decade ago, died, died youngish, 60 I think, uh, who always made the contention, he wrote this paper on the terawatt challenge, made the point that if you have energy, then nothing else matters. You're able to control everything. Of course, you'd have to say now if you have energy, if you have sustainable energy, I guess, in terms of climate change type issues, that would be an issue. But the contention was if you don't have enough water, there's certainly not a shortage of water in the world. There's a shortage of potable water that you can drink, but if you have salt water, then if you have enough energy, then you can turn it into to drinkable water. And so this whole issue of where energy fits into what we do is a, uh, an important thing. John Holdren is the still is, I think, the president's science advisor and basically makes the same comment that energy and its linkage with environment is an intractable problem, but one that's important. And so, although in this class we'll really only talk about uh, Dean apples in groundwater, everything that we talk about is absolutely uh, linked to any fluids flowing in any porous medium. And actually they're the same equations that look at flow of fluids in the cartilage and in the the porous material in your bones. They're exactly the same uh, physical relationships that are used to understand those. And so whether it's looking at geothermal energy, which is one of the projects that uh, Yi is involved in, which is a huge resource, but a very difficult, quite intractable problem to be able to basically create a geothermal reservoir under New York City, where you want to be able to use the power uh, and just by drilling deep enough, we know that if you drill deep enough to five kilometers, the, the thermal gradient is usually something like 25 to 50 degrees centigrade per kilometer. So if you go down five kilometers from roughly zero centigrade at the surface, 20 maybe, then if you go down five kilometers, you're either at 125 or 250 degrees centigrade, 250 degrees C, you can certainly boil water, and you can use hot water in exactly the same way as you would in a, a coal-fired power plant without using fossil fuels. And so for EGS, Enhanced Geothermal Systems, the idea is to be able to drill down, to be able to stimulate. Stimulate is a nice way of saying fracture. 
not necessarily hydraulically fracture, but uh, stimulate, so that you can actually inject water down a hole which comes out, have it flow across to a return borehole, and I guess it's the other way around. It comes down cold into the reservoir, goes across the reservoir as a big geological heat exchanger, just like a radiator in your car, picks up heat, then brings it back to the surface. You take the heat out of the water, uh, you flash it, you generate electricity from it, and then you re-inject the cold water to just keep on the cycle. And so minimally invasive in theory, a holy grail. If ever this is a mechanism that's cracked, we've been trying to do it for 40 years now, uh, and haven't done that, then you'll have a sustainable way of being able to pull uh, cheap, almost um, unlimited energy out of the subsurface. So what is this? So the, the hydrothermal um, potential in the U.S., is 10 to the 4 exajoules. That's 10 to the 18, is it 8, 10 to the 18, or 10 to the 21? I think 10 to the 18 joules, um, which is like um, the, the, the geysers and uh, the salt and sea geothermal fields on the west coast of the US, only at very specific locations on plate boundaries. If you look at the resource underneath the rest of the US, it's uh, a thousand times larger than that. And so, to put in perspective, we use, the world uses something like 500 exajoules per year. So, 500 exajoules is about the same as 500 quads if you use uh, BTU, quadrillion BTU. It's also the same as 500 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. So each one of these, if you switch completely to natural gas, you could power the whole world on something like 500 uh, trillion cubic feet. So for two years, it's 1,000 trillion cubic feet. Uh, so this would be 10 to the 3. So it would be 20,000 years. You could run the, the world for 20,000 years on the amount of thermal energy immediately under our feet in the U.S. if you could tap it and it would be relatively clean. So a huge resource. Obviously, we're not quite doing that yet, and so obviously there's some, presumably there's some technical problems to solve. So it makes it interesting science. Uh, but we're not quite there. Nuclear power. Uh, again, non-fossil resource. You can argue whether that's sustainable or not. It certainly is a finite resource. But of course, everything is finite, even the sun. Uh, it just depends on the, the time scales that you're looking at. But the big issue for uh, radioactive waste disposal is in looking at its uh, deep underground disposal. The U.S. plan before healthcare in 2009, when Harry Reid was a um, Senate, uh, Senate majority leader, right, whose home state is Nevada and whose repository would have gone in Nevada and who didn't want a repository in Nevada, uh, all of a sudden, this became non-viable in the first beginning of the first uh, Obama administration. And so you can debate as to why that was, but it's probably had some linkage to the fact that votes for health care were, were needed to be able to, to get uh, the Affordable Care Act through um, the Senate. Uh, but anyway, the idea of a repository would be a whole bunch of these underground tunnels. These are all tunnels that are parallel to each other. They are relatively large, maybe 15 meters in diameter, I don't know if there's a scale in here, have these railroad cars <clears throat> with the spent fuel inside them that get run into these tunnels that are parallel to each other, and they get left in the ground in perpetuity. Um, and you hope that nothing happens with it uh, as a function of time. The only mechanism that it can escape is if these canisters rupture in some way. If they do rupture, it doesn't mean anything unless there's some agent to transport it out. The only agent that can possibly transport this out is water. That will take it. It'll dissolve it and carry it. Let's dissolve components. Uh, make carry colloids uh, out to the external biosphere where we live, and of course that would be a bad thing. And so the designs for Yucca Mountain originally had a design life for one million years. So predictions were attempted to be for one million years. So one million years, of course, is a thousand times a thousand years, and you know what we were doing a thousand years ago. And so that's a quite a long uh, window to be able to do that. The other energy-related issue of our time, of course, is to go on burning carbon uh, fossil fuels 
but instead of emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, do something about it. And so doing something about it would be to either um, re-inject it into um, depleted reservoirs um, uh, or depleted shales, re-inject it into coal streams, unminable coal streams where it sorbs, uh, or the favorite idea maybe in terms of the volumes and the fact that many of these are on land is to re-inject it into saline aquifers which occur underneath some kind of trap, a capillary trap that won't let the stuff get out. And so you put it in the ground in a dense state. So CO2 no longer is a gas, but is a liquid. So maybe uh, eight tenths, 80 percent the density of water, maybe 800 kilograms per cubic meter. And then you put it in the ground and you leave it there and hope that it doesn't come out over decades to hundreds of years to give you, to give us a stopgap against being able to burn fossil fuels, which we're using right now. Half the <coughs> energy in the U.S., more than half, comes from uh, fossil fuels uh, for electricity, um, and to be able to do with that way. Yeah. Well, yeah, like if you inject like the carbon dioxide in those saline aquifers, mm -hmm. would that cause like an explosive hazard because you'd be creating like a gas oxygen mix? It's not much oxygen down there, and so and it won't combust. Well, and if you so, added carbon dioxide, wouldn't it like drive the reactions, the formation of gas and oxygen? I don't know if it will, uh, it, it, over time it will be mineralized and it will uh, it will precipitate uh, carbonate minerals. Mm -hmm. But uh, there will be little oxygen there. Uh, it, it'll, it's high, high enough pressure that the only oxygen that's there will be dissolved in water. And I think there will be no combustibles in there. So there will be no gas there. But uh, I, I think there's, there's very little oxygen there and there's no hydrogen. But one of the issues is if you do this on an industrial scale, uh, right now, there are some of these pilot plants, they injected about a million tons per year. And we produce something like 40 billion tons per year is our output of CO2, roughly. So we produce 40,000 times those nominal injection projects. So it becomes an industrial scale. Actually, uh, I think the, the way to think about it is you basically have to have an economy that injects CO2 at exactly as, at a, an equivalent rate to the what we do right now is recover hydrocarbons, the petroleum industry, obviously, right? It's balance, net balance. And so that's a huge, huge undertaking. So it's difficult. And so one of the things that is worried about is the issue of induced seismicity that comes from that. Uh, gas shales uh, is a huge thing that's driven our economy in the last uh, half decade. Uh, big deal in Pennsylvania, big deal in Texas. Uh, big deal in the Bakken, uh, low um, permeability, uh, liquid-rich uh, oil shales. It's a big deal in Western Canada uh, because uh, their resources, which until a decade ago were difficult to recover before two things happened. Horizontal drilling, to be able to spend a long time in these pay zones, which are horizontal aquifers. They're not really aquifers. The difference between a an unconventional reservoir and a conventional reservoir is that there's no trap. In an unconventional reservoir, the gas is produced in place and it's trapped in the pore where it was created. In a conventional reservoir, the gas or oil is produced in some location by organic matter decomposing and then it migrating up into a, a trap where it then sits because it's lighter than water. Uh, but unconventional deposits, they're homogeneous and they're in the material that they were deposited in. The organic that is deposited in deep shales decomposes and it's trapped in place. And so you have to spend a long time with your borehole in the zone. And so these go down 3,000 meters and then may go along a couple of thousand meters within the zone in the Marcellus. And also massive hydraulic fracturing, which of course is kind of con controversial. And so those are the two things that have made uh, gas shales liquids rich gas shales commercially viable in terms of production. Uh, lots of interesting environmental issues that are discussed, not least of which are issues of whether when you fracture it you put gas into the overlying uh, aquifers. Um, to cut a long story short, most of the, the data that are available that have gas in shallow aquifers are thought to be due to the fact that incomplete 
cementing of casing is due to it, but it's un not absolutely uh, conclusively shown that yet. There are some things to show that. Many of you have seen gas lands and other, other related um, uh, popular uh, independent type movies. And so this kind of uh, competition at some level, right, between producing energy, uh, hopefully in a sustainable way, but with some risks that's attached to it, everyone has to decide for themselves exactly, or perhaps communities have to decide for themselves exactly what that risk is. So in Pennsylvania, the, the view at the state level is the risk is not huge. That's why we produce uh, natural gas from Marcellus. And it's become a large industry within, within uh, Pennsylvania. But it's also the same reason why in uh, New York State you can't jet, inject more than 50,000 liters of water uh, because that is the requirement that basically stops any hydraulic fracturing, which makes it unprofitable. And actually they've completely, just in the last uh, few days, uh, completely defined a, a moratorium against any kind of production of gas uh, in uh, shale gas within New York. And that's because the big deal about um, fracking or hydraulic fracturing is that um, to drive one of these wells, you need a lot of water. It takes something like five, th five million gallons of water. So 20 million uh, liters of water to be able to, to fracture one string of wells. And this here is uh, just a, a setup. This, the well is here. All these are individual, are just manifolds, which are taking the feed from all of these pumps to inflate the reservoir to drive hydraulic fractures in the subsurface and to supply this water. <coughs> Typically, the water is taken in in terms of uh, trucks. So quite significant industrialization, I guess, of, of the northern parts of Pennsylvania, where this is uh, a key, uh, key resource that's being recovered right now. Hydraulic fracturing, uh, certainly it causes seismicity. The seismicity is trivial. If you look at, on a scale of the, the moment magnitudes, these are minus 1.6s. Positive is over to the right somewhere. So the big earthquakes that you hear about in Dallas not so long ago, certainly a week ago, are magnitudes 3s and 4s. So each order of magnitude is uh, towards the magnitude is 30 times larger in terms of energy. And so these are, are tiny um, uh, earthquakes. But the seismicity that's talked about uh, in terms of uh, gas production is not due to the fracturing process itself, but it's typically related to taking care of these produced fluids. So you inject 5 million gallons of water to fracture the, the formation. You recover most of that, certainly half of it. And then it can't be used again because now it has all the material in it, the sulfates, that are present in situ, and it's no longer pristine water, and you're worried if you use it for the next frack job that it will seal up and occlude the, the reservoir. And so typically it's taken out of state, and then it's disposed of in uh, Ohio, uh, Youngstown, Ohio. So Youngstown, Ohio, they had a series of earthquakes. And so most of the earthquakes that are related to uh, energy production are not related to fracking, hydraulic fracturing, but actually related to the disposal of the waste waters which go in there. Lots of discussion about what the materials are that are put into the waters. Some guidance now in the um, Department of Energy guidelines that at least that stuff, what goes into this in terms of fungicides and bactericides and friction reducers so that it slips down the hole and doesn't, uh, you don't have to expend lots of energy pushing it down the well, frictional drag on the well, uh, those have to be potentially disclosed. And so they're, they are nasty things. They're a relatively small proportion of what goes into the well. 90% of it's water, 10% is sand as propent, and the very small proportion are nasty things, but nonetheless they are nasty. And so as we kind of started off on this, part of the debate is if you do this in the subsurface, what are the influences on the shallow water, groundwater, uh, potable water regime? And so it's useful to think about this in terms of, again, the relative scale of this. And the relative scale for the Marcellus, uh, some of it's 6,000 feet, but some of it is also 9,000 feet. And the issue then is uh, how far away is that from potable water? Potable water is probably in the top 
500 meters or so, so it's quite deep in comparison. Even deeper in some of the, some of the um, Texan shales, but not guaranteed. It's really a, a, an estimate of risk. And there have been some studies, notably using this idea of looking at uh, water resources in northeastern Pennsylvania and south, I guess, southern tier New York, where there is this kind of interesting experiment going on. Shale production in one state, no shale production in another state. You can look at what this, the levels of um, methane are in groundwater, not so much the other fugitive fluids, and be able to say something about whether there's a, an issue related to this. And if you go horizontally away from individual um, locations, so if you look at water well concentrations of methane, laterally a, a kilometer or two kilometers or three kilometers away from the nearest production well, and plot the methane concentrations, you find that there is indeed a, a relationship between getting closer to a well and having a higher methane concentration. And indeed, if you look at the uh, isotopic composition of these, those methane concentrations are something we want to talk about in this class, uh, isotopes. They are isotopically linked to thermogenically produced methane, which of course is the way in which methane in gas shales is produced by cooking it at depth, maturing it, and then trapping it in place. And so almost certainly the methane that's found close to these wells in this um, distribution above acceptable drinking water standards uh, certainly does increase towards the well, but most likely it's due to the fact that um, uh, the sealing of the well bores and cementing jobs aren't just aren't done particularly well. And, you know, part of this debate over should we, shouldn't we, which of course is part of all, all our lives, part of the big questions, you know, some of the big questions of our times as to whether this is appropriate or not, they revolve around the idea that burning gas instead of coal is about half the burden in terms of uh, carbon per BTU, per unit energy that comes out of it. And uh, one of the reasons for switching to uh, natural gas is that it releases much less uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, although some people would maintain that actually uh, the methane leakage that you get around gas production is even worse than mining and burning coal without CO2 sequestration because, for instance, when you, frack the, um, when you fracture the, the deep uh, shale reservoirs and you pull up the uh, flowback water, dissolved in that is methane, which is just uh, ejected into the atmosphere. And that ejection into the atmosphere is of methane which is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2 itself, which is the reason that why they flare methane in the Bakken, because rather than uh, eject methane into the atmosphere, it's better to burn it, to get no calorific burn benefit from burning it, and to eject CO2, which is much more short-lived than the much more virulent uh, methane, which exists for much longer, longer periods of time in the atmosphere, and has a larger effect in terms of its insulatory properties, I guess. So that's kind of the picture where we're going to go from. So hopefully we've at least introduced what we're going to talk about in the course, what your responsibilities are, what the deliverables are. Um, we've talked in a big way about what we'll talk about. Um, and we will start from now on talking about uh, a discussion of fluids and porous media in terms of multi-phase fluids.